All right, in early physics, a typical discussion of orbits involves a small object like a spaceship orbiting something much larger like the Earth. But today we're going to apply some basic physics to see what happens when these two masses are much more similar in size. I mean, what happens if, say, the sun was to orbit another sun? See, it's a bit surprising, but when you look up into the night sky, more than half the stars you see are actually systems of stars orbiting other stars. Now, there's nothing magical happening in the system of two stars orbiting each other, or in what's called a binary system. Going back to Newton, all objects in orbit are exclusively under the influence of gravity, free-falling toward each other like an apple toward the Earth. And that holds true here, it's just now we have two really big apples. So looking at the free body diagram for each of these masses, there's only the force of gravity pulling each of them inward toward the center of their respective orbits. Now, in the case of the small spaceship orbiting the much larger Earth, you can say the center of the spaceship's orbit is the Earth. But in our binary system over here, that's not the case. In a binary system, both objects orbit their combined center of mass, or what we call the barycenter. And the key to binary systems is in understanding why they orbit that point. See, just like in the case of our spaceship orbiting a planet, the force of gravity is acting as the centripetal force. The difference being that in a binary system, we have to consider the centripetal force on both of these objects. Now, mathematically, for any orbit, we can say that the force by gravity is equal to the centripetal force acting on that object. But like I said, because we have two objects orbiting over here, we're actually going to have the centripetal force on both objects. I'm going to say the centripetal force on mass 1 and the centripetal force on mass 2. And those are both equal to one another. It's that same force by gravity that's pulling them together. So what we're going to do is set our two centripetal forces equal to one another and expand out each of these terms to find out exactly where the center of mass of this system actually lays. Now centripetal force is given by the mass of an object times its velocity squared divided by the radius of the circle which it's traveling in. In this case, it'd be the radius of orbit. Now, making this equation specific to each of these masses, first looking at mass 1, we're going to say that mass has some value m1, and is traveling around in a circle as some velocity v1. That's squared over, I'm going to call it r1, that is the distance from the barycenter, or center of mass, to the orbit. Now we're going to set that equal to the centripetal force acting on this second object. I'm going to call that m2, v2, over r2. And realize, because this outer orbit is a larger radius, the smaller mass out here is actually going to be moving at a greater velocity. These two velocities are not the same. Now the catching, finding where this barycenter is, involves getting rid of the velocity here. Now realize, for anything going in a circle, the velocity is given by 2 pi r, that is the circumference of the circle, divided by the time it takes for that object to move once around a circle, or what we call the period. Now subbing this equation in here for v1 and here for v2, we get a pretty big equation here, but luckily quite a bit's going to cancel out here. The 4 pi squareds on both sides, and you'll notice this r1 in the denominator partially cancels out with the r1 up in the numerator. We see the same thing over here. And there's one more thing that's going to cancel out here, and that goes back to a really important idea of what's going on in a binary system. And that is that if it takes a certain amount of time for this inner mass to move around once, it's going to take the same amount of time for that outer mass to orbit once. Or you could say the two periods are equal to one another. Meaning these two periods are also going to cancel out. And this leaves us with this equation, which relates the two orbiting masses to their distance from the center of mass. Now, it may not seem obvious, but this equation actually proves that these two masses are orbiting around their center of mass.
You see, if you were to view these two masses as though they were not masses in orbit around one another, but rather, say, two masses sitting on the end of a seesaw, the balance point or the center of mass between those two masses would actually follow this equation. Now, you'll notice in looking at this equation, if one mass is much, much larger than the other, the radius of the larger mass's orbit reduces down to the point where it essentially remains still. And the other mass orbits around it, like our spaceship orbiting the Earth. So knowing these two objects are orbiting their center of mass, let's take this a step farther and relate the period of orbit to the mass of each of our objects, as well as the distance between them. Now to relate these masses to the distance between them as well as the, the value of the masses, what we need to do is we need to set the force by gravity equal to the centripetal force on either one of these masses. And it really doesn't matter which one. I'm just going to go with mass 1. Now the force by gravity is given by Newton's law of universal gravitation. That is g, the gravitational constant, multiplied by the product of the two masses, divided by the distance between the two masses squared. And this distance is key here. You see, this distance is not the distance from one mass to the center of orbit. It's the distance from one mass all the way to the other. Or really, you could say it's the sum of the two radii combined. And that'll become important later on here. Now, centripetal force is going to be no different than what we saw over here. mv squared over r. And just like we did over here relating velocity to period, we're going to do the same thing over here. And again, we'll see a few things cancel out. The m1 cancels out, and r1 partially cancels out. Now remember, we're trying to relate the two masses to the distance between them and their period. That means we need to get rid of this r1 value right here. And to do that, we're going to go back to really what d actually means. Remember, d the distance between the two masses is equal to the sum of their two orbital radii. And we already related these two radii to one another down here. So subbing this equation in over here, I'm going to write it right here. We're going to be able to come up with an expression for this value r1. Distributing this m2 in, and then rearranging for r1, we get an expression for r1 not as a function of r2 like we had over here, but as a function of our masses, as well as the distance between them. And remember, the whole point of this was to try to get rid of this R1 up here. So I'm going to sub this term in right there. And you'll notice our M2 cancels out, which brings a bit of symmetry to this. And then rearranging for the period. And we get one of the most fundamental equations in all of astrophysics. Kepler's third law. You see, in 1609, Johannes Kepler arrived at this relationship between the period of orbit between these two objects and the distance between them. But really, as he did that 30 years before Newton was even born. See, he did this not through derivation like we did here, but by looking at lots and lots of data that had been collected over the better part of the 1500s. Now, I worked out everything here as though these orbits are circular. But the mechanics hold true for elliptical orbits, the difference being that in an elliptical orbit, we trade the radius of orbit for the length of the semi-major axis, where the center of mass of the system lies at the focal point of both of these ellipses. So I hope you found this useful. And on that note, that's all for now.